Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Paul Clark uh, from Penn State University. Uh, I am president-elect of Lyra, and it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the 74th annual meeting of our association. Uh, we have a great program uh, over the next four days. Uh, we hope you will take advantage of as many sessions as possible. Uh, the program committee uh, has put a lot of work in to provide the best program we can, and, and we're quite, quite pleased with the way uh, it has shaped up. Uh, before we begin, uh, uh, just a housekeeping detail. Uh, uh, I wanted to remind everyone of our association's code of conduct. Uh, our LIRA annual meeting is convened for the purposes of professional development and educational exchange uh, in the spirit of free inquiry and free expression uh, and harassment is against our code of conduct. Please see our website under quick links uh, if you have any questions. But now I'd like to introduce the program. Uh, the title of this year's program is Elevating Voice and New Voices in the Workplace and Beyond. The, CRO, the program committee uh, recognizes that uh, or recognize that one of the universal workplace challenges from the beginning of employment relationships to now is the desire of employees to have a voice in their work. Over the centuries, workers have slowly gained greater voice, but progress has, uh, but progress made has been insufficient and has differed greatly for different groups of workers. Uh, the theme of this meeting recognizes both the primary importance of employee voice in the workplace and the need to extend that same voice to all those workers who have not had equal opportunities to be heard in the past. And we have many sessions that will speak to that theme. To start the program and our first plenary session, I would like to introduce Wilma Liebman, uh, president of Lyra. Uh, Wilma is a well-known figure in the Lyra community. Uh, she served as chair of the National Labor Relations Board under President Obama and was first nominated to be a, a board member by President Clinton and renominated by President Bush. I will provide a more in-depth bio when I introduce Wilma at the presidential session. Wilma, welcome. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you also for your very, uh, very hard work in putting this program together in your role as program chair and president-elect. Uh, it was my pleasure to interview Secretary of Labor Martin Walsh in late April. I interviewed him for last year's annual meeting not long after he was sworn in as secretary. He graciously agreed to return and reflect on the last year's challenges. Our interview was pre-recorded. Before becoming secretary, uh, Marty Walsh served as mayor of the city of Boston for seven years and before that as a state representative. Earlier, he followed his father into Laborers Local 223 in Boston and then rose to head the Building and Con Construction Trades Council from 2011 to 2013. Among other accomplishments as mayor, he led the creation of nearly 140,000 jobs, helped secure a statewide $15 an hour minimum wage, paid sick leave and paid parental leave. As secretary, he's actively engaged in a multitude of initiatives, especially as presented by the pandemic and related economic challenges. And as you will hear, he has a strong connection to working people and commitment to creating an economy that works for all. Uh, our pre-recorded interview will follow, but please remain after the interview for some brief follow-up remarks. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today. You're the opening plenary session for the 74th annual meeting of the 
Labor and Employment Relations Association. You were gracious enough and generous enough to uh, talk with me last year and uh, delighted to have you back a year later to reflect on your first year in your position. Um, as you know, Lyra is a uniquely uh, diverse community of scholars, uh, practitioners, advocates, labor management, business, government neutrals, uh, and they are all going to be very interested from their own perspectives on what you have to say today. So let me start by asking you to reflect back on your first year in this job um, as Secretary of Labor. What would you say have been the biggest surprises that you've encountered um, in the job here in Washington, D.C.? Um, what would you say are your the, been the biggest challenges, the biggest achievements? What are you most proud of? Well, first of all, thank you for having me today. It's exciting. And, and as we were talking about heading to the Zoom room, um, <laughs> hopefully next year we can be in person and we can be sitting I on a stage so. having a conversation. Next year in Detroit. Yeah, I hope you, so, so I want to start there. But thank you for the work you do and everyone at Lyra. Uh, you know, the, the first year for me has been exciting, uh, has been challenging. Uh, I've had ups and downs. And... Um, you know, my previous role as mayor of Boston was, I, I knew that pretty well. I had been there for seven years. Uh, the last few months of that, or the last year of that, were difficult because the pandemic began in March of 2020. So the difference is, when I was the mayor and we went to remote work, I knew the team. Uh, I had built the team, I had worked with the team, and I knew the work was going on. So when I, when I got sworn in as Secretary of Labor in March of 2021, uh, it was a little complicated because there wasn't a lot of people in the building. There wasn't a lot of people in my office. It was mostly remote. Uh, the team was kind of created for me uh, with, you know, through the, through the, the administration and, and, and all of that stuff. Uh, so it took me a few months to kind of transition, well, maybe a little more than a few months, <laughs> to transition from being a mayor into being the Secretary of Labor. Um, the beauty about being the Secretary of Labor is that we have, I have a, we have a president uh, that is so focused on supporting workers in America, whether that's through collective bargaining, whether that's through job training, whether that's through whatever it might be. So that made the transition a little easier for me. Uh, but it's it's been a learning experience. You know, it's it's a it's a, you know, in some ways it's 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 a different. It's a very different skill set. Uh, but but I've I've had a good time learning it. Uh, it's funny. I I called a, a former uh, secretary from the Obama administration who used to be mayor. And I asked him how long did it take him to transition from being a mayor to the secretary. And he said it took him a good nine months, that, that he would be thinking back about his old job a lot and wondering why he did this job. And then he, he, he did, I think he did almost eight years in the Obama administration. He said by the end of his time as secretary, it was the best job he ever had. Uh, and, and so I'm, tra I'm still, my brain is still transitioning. Hopefully you'll be able to say yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> my, my brain's still transitioning. But, you know, we've done a lot of great things here in this administration. And uh, we're still, you know, we have to keep in perspective. I tell people all the time, we're still living in a pandemic time. So, so no matter all the great wins you have or all the great things we're doing, we're still living in a very turbulent time for, for, for the average American worker. Yes, and your workforce has not yet come back to the building, have they yet? No, well, we're, we're, at a, we're at about 75% of the workforce coming back. Uh, and I think in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have more people in the building. Uh, you know, there's still lots of challenges for workers out there. You know, child care is a real issue. Uh, many child care facilities went out of business or, or, or weren't able to fully return after COVID. Uh, that's an issue. People are still concerned about the about the vac about the COVID about getting COVID and, and the different variants that are out there. I mean, every day I hear somebody new getting COVID, and you know, the the impacts generally if your facts are boosted. The impacts on you physically are less, but sometimes you hear stories of people being really sick. So uh, there's a lot going on, but I'm looking forward to being able to walk the halls because I'm a walker in, 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 in my place. I like to drop in offices, and I've been able to do it now more lately and just see people I haven't met before and introduce myself, say hello. I like to do that, and, and uh, I think it's good for the organization and camaraderie. Uh, but we are looking also at a hybrid model in some areas. So we're looking at hybrid. I mean, I think the there's something behind the, 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 the telework uh, and the Zoom world that works. So I think, there's a, I think the workplace is going to look very different in the future. Uh, no doubt. So if you could identify one, your proudest achievement of the last year, could you do oh, that? Oh, God. Um, proudest achievement of the last year. I don't think there's one. I think, mm -hmm. I think there's been a lot of great things here in, in this department that we've done. I think I'm very proud of our folks at ETA who have done a lot of work on on the $2 billion from the American Rescue Plan into unemployment insurance and revamping and looking at unemployment insurance. 
looking at our folks that are working in workforce development and job training, uh, really thinking about how do we skill workers up, how do we get workers better prepared for jobs uh, now. A lot of workers are leaving their job because they were working two and three jobs to make ends meet, and, and we have an opportunity to, to skill them up with skills to allow them the opportunity to work for companies that are looking for workers. I'm proud of that work that we've done. Um, I personally um, have been able to go down in a mine. Uh, I went down in a mine to, to see what mine workers uh, have to do every day going to work. Just amazing the work that they do. Uh, I've had a chance to tour, go around the country. I uh, visited 35 states, about 70 cities, uh, and talking to workers of, of all, you know, all different types of workers in America, what they're struggling. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy that you know we're working. We're able to focus on where we are with employment now in the, in the country. Our unemployment rate today, as of right now, is about 3.6 percent. Um, you know, which is a great number, but our unemployment rate in the black community is double that. So we have work to do. So I'm proud of laying down the foundation and, and our focus on equity and inclusion. Um, Working with the Infrastructure Investment Act that was that the president signed, you know we have a seat at the table there to talk about workers' rights and protection. So there's a lot of great things. So I, I can't, I wouldn't be fair to say there's one 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 sense one thing that we did that those out, out, you know is, is more beneficial or gratifying the other thing. I will say this: I, I appreciate the work people I work with every day. I don't think that um, public employees necessarily get a, a, the credit they deserve, and the folks that work at the Department of Labor, both the political and career folks here, they're really doing amazing work. I think that's right, and I'm, I know they appreciate your saying yeah. that. So I, I know, having been here today, that you have millions of different demands on your time. How do you go about setting your, your time, or, or more specifically, setting priorities, and have your priorities changed in the last year? Yeah, um, it's funny. We, it's no different than when I was mayor, really. You know, we, you come up with a plan and what you want to do, and then, you know, after, after 3 o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> the plan is out the window and you're on to something else. So, so it really is about staying focused. And, and the way that we're structured here uh, is, you know, I have a chief, a chief of staff, a deputy chief of staff, and I have advisors and counselors, and then we have the leadership of, of Department of Labor. And so it really is, is empowering. I like to empower people to try and empower the folks that work with me every day to make sure that we're carrying, following through on the agenda items and thinking about how we're moving forward. Uh, obviously, the priorities change from, from, from kind of day to day in some cases. Uh, you know, when at the beginning when I took over, it was about getting, you know, why were so many women out of the workforce and how do we get women back into the workforce? And I'd work with the Women's Bureau and the Veterans Bureau and in different areas about focusing on, on women and getting people back in, into work. Uh, then we, we, we had a, a period of people resigning and how do, we, how do we encourage people to come back in the workforce? That's on the worker side of it. Uh, and then, you know, we've had an increase this year, unfortunately, of fatalities in our mine area, in, in the mining. Uh, so, you know, we, we called a meeting about a month ago with the, the major companies that do mining and talk about how do we share best practices, how do we, that's kind of an issue that pops up every now and then, not necessarily mining debts, but like, you know, those emergency issues you got to deal with right away. Uh, those pop up. And then the legislative priorities, working, you know, I'm, I'm pulled into a lot of meetings at the White House as well. On, on issues that aren't necessarily related to labor, but you know, economic issues and things like that. Obviously, inflation's another one. How do we deal with inflation? So, you know, the, it's like any job. It's like anybody that's watching today. You know, you have a job, and if you look at the job description, that's what it is. And, and oftentimes, we spend a lot more time doing other things. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, the main focus is we want to empower workers here at the Department of Labor morning, noon, and night. And what that means is we represent workers from the minute they wake up in the morning until the minute they put their head in the pillow at night to make sure that, that, that you know, whether it's their wages or benefits or health care or what, child care, whatever it might be, that we're doing everything we can to support the American worker. And so you've spoken a lot about the opportunities that were afforded to you in your life. And uh, I think you've spoken f frequently about how you want equity and opportunity to be a focus of the programs here at the Department yeah. of Labor. Um, You've, you've alluded to this, but do you, would you like to say more about that? Yeah, I mean, when you think about, you know, whether, uh, before I did this interview, I was being interviewed by a, a press outlet, and they were talking to me about opportunities. And, and when President Biden began his, his run for president, um, he, he would talk about Build Back Better. And, and, and what he was talking about, not necessarily the legislation that eventually got filed, but he was talking about where we are in the world today, where we are in the pandemic today, where we are with society today. And he was looking at communities that have been left behind. 
and, and he talked about really creating a pathway into the middle class. And whether it was my time as a state rep, as a building trades guy, or mayor of Boston, now here, um, we really have to think in this country a little stronger about how do we create pathways into the middle class. Many communities left behind, in particular the African American community and Latino community, and women, quite honestly, have been left behind in the past. And, and when we think about coming out of the pandemic, we think about all the investments in job training, all the investments in workforce development, the money in the infrastructure law that, that's, that, that's being invested in the country. We talk about the Potential CHIPS Act. We talk about building and buying American. All of those things, we have to do a better job of making sure communities of color and women and people that has, and, and, you know, rural America that have been historically left behind, that they have a pathway into the middle class. You know, we were a country at one point that more people were in the middle class than not. Today, we have more people out of the middle class that should be. So we, we need to do a lot better job uh, of making sure that we, we level all boats. I don't know what the right word is. Bring, you know, bring all boats up. <laughs> Lift all boats up. Uh, you know, and I think we have a unique opportunity here at the Department of Labor with myself uh, and, and working with my team, but also working across cabinet. We're working with, you know, Gina Raimondo in commerce. We're working with um, Secretary Cardona in, in education, thinking about how do we train people, how do we make sure people coming out of school are ready to get into jobs. We have commerce, obviously there's business at the table, labor, uh, and we're doing a lot more of that. On the equity side of it, I mean, quite honestly, we need to do a much better in our country. If we learned anything after George Floyd got killed, I mean, George Floyd conversation or when he got killed, the, the, the real – the emphasis seemed around community policing or policing in the country, but it was more, so much deeper than that. It was about inequity. It was about inequality. It was about lost opportunity, lost, you know. We really have to pay attention, not just to the policing aspect of that, what happened with George Floyd getting killed, but also the, the equity problem. I mean, if you watch those marches that were going around uh, cities in America, there were many people holding signs about equity and equality. And it wasn't in policing. It was in, in job, jobs and access to jobs. So I think we have a unique opportunity to do some, some really deep stuff here. I spoke to the president about it. I spoke to the vice president about it. Um, you know, and I'm taking the direction from the White House, but I also learned in Boston what, what works and what doesn't. Yes. And so um, related to this, how do you feel about the media coverage that you and the department are getting? I mean, certainly President Biden has been portrayed as the most pro-worker, pro-union even no. uh, administration president in decades, if not forever. Do you feel that you, your activities and the department are getting the kind of media attention and, fo and messaging that you would like? Would you like to see something different, different emphasis, different focus? I better be careful on this answer. Um, <laughs> I, I wish the media would cover the Department of Labor and cover this administration on what we're doing. And, and, and unfortunately, I think, and, and it's, I'm not blaming the media reporters. They have to do what they're told. But everyone's looking for the, for the kind of glamorous story or, or that catchy headline. And I think that a lot of people aren't getting the, the, the appropriate news across the country on actually what's happening within the Department of Labor or, quite honestly, in this government. We, we spend more time talking about, um, you know, stuff that, you know, grabs the headline. Uh, and, and, and I think that people say, you know, people think bad news sells papers. I don't think it does. I think if we spent more time writing about good positive stories about what we're doing, it would be important. But, but in some cases, you know, I do get a chance to, to get to the media and do get my message out there, even though in small snippets, particularly like the, the TV media. I, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to media around the country, um, you know, the, the local stations. That, that's where I feel is the best way to connect to American people. Uh, but I, I think that the media, I, I would love to see them write. I would love to see, not just the media, I'd love to see more periodicals write about what's happening in America and what we're doing and what needs to happen in America. And don't focus on the negative. Focus on the be level, what we have to do, what we're not doing, and how we can do it better. I would love to see more of that. I, and I hope, I mean, I'm sure there are a few media people in our audience today, uh, and I hope that they really listen to you because you are an extremely eloquent and passionate defender of mm -hmm. the work you're doing, and not only defender, but messenger for the work you're doing. Well, I'll give, an, ex I'll give an example. If there were media in the, in, in the audience, the story will be about what I said about the media. <laughs> and, and what it should be about is what uh -huh. we spoke about. Yeah, all the other things. Equity yes. and, and things like that. That's what the conversation should be. Yeah. Um, so speaking of high-profile things, there are obviously a number of pretty high-profile organizing campaigns going on right yep. now. More worker activism than we've seen in decades. Um, 
At the same time, the resistance to unionization is as it's always been, very traditional anti-union resistance and avoidance strategies. Nonetheless, do you think that there's any opening for a less adversarial approach to worker organizing and, and, and union activity? And is there a possibility that this could be an inflection point both in worker organizing and in um, um, successful unionization? I, I definitely think it's an inflection point, and I think there's an opportunity here for the, the labor movement to um, not just grow the ranks of organized labor, but really think about what's the future of the labor movement look like. And I think there's really that, that opportunity in front of us right now. And I think that you know some of the companies that are resisting the labor movement or unions are thinking about the, they, they see a story on TV with a rat in front of the building or they look at something like that. And I think there's an opportunity for better relationships, coordinations. I'll say this, you know, work, companies in America are paying their workers more. Many companies in America have upped the minimum wage to $15 an hour, $18 an hour, $20 an hour in response to getting people back into work. Um, 70% of the American people, or 70% of a poll uh, they were polled a few months ago, say that they look favorably upon unions. It's the highest number that I can ever remember. I think companies need to pay attention to that and realize rather than resist in a big way, they need to maybe reach out and embrace, embrace and how do you bring people in. When I ran the building trades in Boston in 2011, um, I didn't spend my time with union companies and with union to developers who built union, I spent my time talking to non-union companies and developers who built non-union. And it wasn't an adversarial relationship. I went in there talking, how do I do some of your work? And can you give me a little bit of your work to try and create opportunities a pathway? And I'm not looking for 100% today, and I'm not going to be pounding you over the head. I want to have this conversation. And what I found was, you know, I wasn't always successful, but people were very appreciative that I came in with that approach. And, and, and it worked in some cases. And I think that you know, th this resistance of organized labor, um, you know, I, I, was so vehemently and putting in millions and millions of dollars in, I, I think that's the wrong approach to do. And, you know, the president's been very clear. He supports collective bargaining. He supports workers' rights to organize. I do as well. Uh, and, and I would much prefer to see uh, people sit down at the table and have, you know, conversations. Um, you know, my job is not to organize in this anymore. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the Secretary of Labor, but I also think labor has an opportunity here to change the way that they've done business in the past. And, you know, so I think both sides have to think about how to approach this moving forward. But you are seeing lots of organizing drives in the country. You're seeing successful organizing drives in the country. Um, the Amazon workers in, in Staten Island was a very successful organizing drive when you think about that. Uh, I know there's Starbuck workers and other workers going around the country. So peop there's something going on that, that people need to pay attention to. Yes, definitely. Um, so last year you said, and I just listened to our interview again yesterday, you said, I don't believe in labor versus capital. I think there's lots of room for common ground. You've just alluded to that. Um, do you see it happening in any real sense? I mean, oh, the building trades, I worked for the Bricklayers Union for a number of years, so I know the little bit of uniqueness mm -hmm. of the building trades. But do you see it happening? What have you seen in the last year? And do you see an opening for yourself as secretary to help foster that kind of dialogue? I definitely think there's an opening, and I've been able to interject myself by being asked in different contract negotiations around the country, and we've been successful in a bunch of different ones that, that have either been at a standstill or just stalemate or whatever you want to call it, and being just encouraging both sides to sit down and talk at the table. I, I think that the day that people are trying to make as much money as possible and not pay back to employees, I think those days are, are, are winding down. I think that people are going to have to start to pay employees more and, and respect. We we're seeing it in the, in the job force, the job today, job uh, workforce today, I should say. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I think what I would encourage is, it's a little away from your question, but I would encourage people to sit down and have dialogues at the table. This adversarial relationship doesn't help anyone, especially right now. I mean, you know, when you think about every, the first Friday of every month is Jobs Day, and, and I get a chance to look at the labor participation rate, I get to look at the unemployment rate, I get to see the un uh, unemployment rate for the black community, the Latino community, the Asian community, the white community, women, men, the uh, Native American community, and I look at those numbers very, very closely. And, and I look at the numbers of people who are not in the workforce, and, and they're not in the workforce for a reason. And, and whether it's low pay or non, non they're not getting satisfaction, I think we have an opportunity right now, not just for labor to think of reinvent themselves in some ways, but businesses need to think of as well. And both sides need to be that. I, I spend a lot of time, when I go around the country, you know, I'll talk to unions, businesses, worker rights groups, 
undocumented workers, um, child care facilities. I talk to them all and I hear the story. And, and everyone kind of wants the same thing. They want a, a pathway into the middle class. They want to be able to, you know, put food on the table, a roof over their head, take care of their family. And if they work for business, they want their business to be successful. I mean, I think we need to focus more on who we are and what we're all about and where we're going. Yeah, thank you for that. I know that we are running short of time, but before we close, um, and before I invite you to come back next year, hopefully in Detroit, happy to be here face to face with you this today. We've, we've progressed a little since yeah, last year. Um, but uh, before we close, uh, and I thank you, I wanted to know if you want to say a few words about the task force on worker yeah. organizing. Yeah, well, thanks for bringing that yeah. up. I should have brought that up. You yeah. know, I, I was, um, a funny quick story, when I was asked by the president to be on, on the task force, be on the task force, I thought I was chairing the task force. And, and when I found out I wasn't chairing the task force, I'm like, well, who's chairing the task force? I'm the secretary of labor, the vice president. So I'm like, oh, okay, it's all right. But uh, a lot of great work was done on the task force. There was 70 recommendations. The vice president did an amazing job of coordinating uh, a lot of conversation, a lot of input in that document. That document is about empowering workers. It's about creating opportunities for workers to, to whether to organize or, or to use collective power to, to better themselves in this situation. Uh, the task force put the recommendations out, I believe it was October. Um, we're going to have a follow-up in the next couple of weeks, I think, on the task force. We, we, we made a, we made a um, decision that every six months we're going to kind of revisit the task force. Mm -hmm. uh, it's looking internally at the federal government and how are we creating better pathways into middle class some of it was done by executive order by the president, raising the federal minimum wage, signing executive order on PLAs, looking at Davis Bacon and prevailing wage, and some of it is also how do how do we strengthen workers. So it was a, it was a really good document with a lot of work put into it. Very little resistance, to be honest with you. Like no no one has come out. Well, maybe somebody has, but not many people have come out and said that it, it's a terrible document and it's going to end society as we know it. And and, and I, I got to give a lot of credit obviously to the president for, for putting this task. I think it's one of the, it might be the first of its kind. As far as I know. Yeah, to, to put it together. And then and then picking the vice president to lead it along with myself as co-chair. And, and the, the people that put the document together did amazing work. Good. Well, thank you so much. I wish we had more time to talk. You're, you've been so rich in your discussion and your uh, your passion for the no, subject. No, thank you. And I hope you guys have, I hope you have a great conference. And, and, thank you. and I want to thank everyone who's watching for the work you do, um, you know, we, whether through organizations or individually, thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we're getting through a very difficult chapter in American history right now, and we're going to get to the other side. So just take care of yourself. And I hope you say it is an inflection point for the better. It is. So no, it is. It certainly it's is. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and my privilege. Thank well, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, listening to the Secretary of Labor. I think you would probably share my view about how genuine and candid and insightful he was about so many things. Um, as a perfect segue to his last uh, discussion of the task force, I wanna just turn for a few brief comments uh, to Lynn Reinhardt. Lynn is the former general counsel of the AFL-CIO, uh, but now she is serving as a senior counselor to the Secretary of Labor. Her primary role is to support Secretary Walsh in his role as vice chair of the task force on worker organizing and empowerment. Uh, she was also very, very helpful in helping to secure the secretary's ag agreement to come back and talk with us today. So Lynn, looking at you. Thank you, Wilma, and thank you for uh, inviting me to spend a couple of minutes with you this morning. I want to say, first of all, um, kudos to you, Wilma, for a really wonderful interview with Secretary Walsh. You really uh, captured the secretary and his personality and uh, in a really wonderful way. And if anybody had any doubts about the wisdom of doing a recorded interview between Wilma and the secretary, uh, it's a good thing that it's a recorded interview because unfortunately the day before yesterday, the secretary tested positive for COVID like so many people have, and you wouldn't have had him here live for that interview. So well done. Um, uh, as Wilma said, uh, my primary role here at the Labor Department is to support the Secretary on the Task Force on Worker Organizing. And as he said, uh, the report issued in February contains more than 70 recommendations for how executive branch agencies across the government, Department of Defense, Small Business Administration, EPA, can take action to support worker organizing and collective bargaining in both the public and private sectors. And at the Labor Department, we have at least 10 action items that we're working on um, uh, to try to 
support worker organizing and bargaining. And one of them in particular, uh, we are hoping to work with and partner with all of you um, to make it a success. And I really appreciate Lyra's uh, allowing me a minute here to tell you about it and um, Lyra's partnership on this project. And that is uh, the Department of Labor is setting up an online worker organizing resource and knowledge center, the work center, which is gonna be a one-stop shopping place where workers, employers, agencies, students, academics, anybody can go to get information on unions, the union advantage, the importance of unions in communities and to our economy and to employers um, as, as an equity tool. Um, and also uh, examples of successful labor management partnerships. Um, we want to really get the word out there more fully about the benefits of unionization um, and the really wonderful things that labor management collaborations have produced uh, for employers and workers across the country over the years. So we are collecting stories. And um, when I stop talking and figure out how to do it, I'm gonna put a link in the chat um, to a story collection form and really encourage you to use it and to spread it around and to help us populate this new online worker organizing resource center with stories of successful organizing and also stories of successful labor management collaborations um, and really appreciate your partnership as we build out this resource center. We also, and I'll put this in the chat, have an email address devoted to the work center, workcenter at dol.gov. Um, and we would love your suggestions uh, and recommendations of material that we should put up on the site. We have already mined um, papers by many of you that you'll see there when the site goes live in a couple of months. Um, but we welcome your suggestions. And lastly, um, I wanted to let you know that the Office of Labor Management Standards here at the Department of Labor, which is, of course, the office that primarily regulates union um, elections and finances and such, um, is uh, building out its work on labor management partnerships. Uh, it was something that OLMS used to do in the past, and it kind of got away from it. And uh, Jeff Freund, the director of OLMS, is really committed to building out this area of OLMS's work and recently hired a new person whose job is going to be solely focused on building out labor management partnership work. Her name is Darnice Marsh, and I'm going to put her contact information in the chat as well and really encourage anybody who wants to connect with her on labor management partnerships to do so. So um, thank you. There's, uh, I'm also going to put a link in the chat uh, to everything else that's going on in the world of the task force. And if anybody wants to follow up and talk about any of it anymore, I'm happy to do so. Um, it is the, fir the first ever effort of this kind. So it's, it's pretty exciting and pretty daunting at the same time. So thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you for your hard work on this task force and all the follow-up. And thank you for inviting the Lira community to uh, work with you on this. I encourage everyone to follow up. Um, next up, we have a full day of breakout sessions and meetings. Please consult your agenda. Uh, at 2.15, there will be the National Policy Forum Plenary on the subject of antitrust law as a mechanism for addressing wage suppression and income inequality. Uh, the day will end with a virtual happy hour at 5.45 p.m. I thank you all for being here this morning, for your support of Lyra, and for your participation in this meeting. Look forward to seeing you during the next few days. <laughs>